There are four key categories of technologies, all of which are improving by double-digit, maybe triple-digit basis every year. Each one of them is disruptive in its own way, but they enable one another, and when combined with one another, they create a virtuous cycle of disruption. Can be energy storage, batteries, in other words. So, if you use a laptop, if you use a, a game, if you use a, um, um, you know, one of these, essentially you're using lithium-ion batteries. From 95 to about 2010, lithium-ion batteries improved by about 14% per year. So dollars per kilowatt hour improved by about 14% per year. Um, by about 2009, something interesting happened. Two new industries came into lithium ion, automotive and energy. Um, and when that happened, basically investments went up, demand went up, uh, uh, improvements in technology went up, and from 2010 to 2014, the cost curve actually accelerated to 16% per year. And when we look at the last year and a half, when we get the actual numbers, we may actually see that it's actually accelerating even more than 16%. But even if we take that 16% cost curve, then this is what we do. We extend it out over the next 3, 5, 7, 10, 15 years, and this is what the cost curve of batteries is going to be in the foreseeable future. Um, and that assumes, of course, that it's possible chemically and, and physically and, 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 and so on for, um, for batteries to keep going at that, at that rate. Now, I'm not saying lithium-ion is going to be the winner in 10 years, but what I'm saying is whoever comes up with another technology is going to have to beat this cost curve, right? So, let's take that cost curve. How is it happening? I mean, how are people pushing the cost down so quickly? I mean, beyond 16%. So, um, this, this is a battery. Does anyone drive a Model S, a Tesla Model S here? Yay. Um, so, the Tesla Model S has 7,000 of these batteries, a little bit bigger than these, the 18650 batteries. The way that you make one of these is you mine the lithium, say, in Chile or Argentina or Australia. You ship that to, say, China, where it's refined to 99 plus percent purity. You ship, they ship that to Japan or Korea, in this case, Japan, Panasonic. They put it in this form in, in Japan or Korea. And then they ship it to California, where Tesla put 7,000 of these into one Model S. Now, there's a lot of waste in that supply chain, right? Just by cutting the waste, just by putting a lot of that supply chain in one place in Reno, Nevada, essentially Tesla is going to cut the cost by anywhere from 30 to 50 percent over the next few years. And that doesn't even include technology innovation, which is improving, right? And according to Elon Musk, it's going to improve at about 5 percent. So that is what's going to keep that cost curve going down over the next few years. But it's all, not just Tesla. I mean, when Tesla announced the prices for the Powerwall, now those prices are actually ahead of my curve. Ahead of my curve. I mean, two years ago, people were thinking 16% per year? That's too aggressive. Well, guess what? That's ahead of my curve. So I'm going to have to adjust my curve when I get actual market data. And just to show you the size of the market at those prices, Tesla got a billion dollars in orders within two weeks of announcing the Powerwall. So the Gigafactory, which in and of itself would have doubled world production of lithium-ion batteries, is actually going to be expanded another 45 percent just for grid storage. Um, that's how interesting that market is. But Tesla's not the only one doing this. Companies like BYD have said, we're going to build factories every bit as large as yours, right? Mine is as big as yours. 
Um, Foxconn, LG Chem, BYD, uh, I mean, there's a whole Samsung SDI, there's a whole bunch of companies that are investing massively in lithium-ion batteries. Just a few weeks ago, for instance, LG Chem announced that they're canceling a $4.2 billion petrochemical deal in Kazakhstan and putting that money into batteries. So a lot of money is leaving like old industries and getting into batteries because the opportunity is so huge. And because of all of these investments, essentially the cost curve may actually accelerate beyond that 16%. And the other thing that um, basically is important in, in disruption is business model innovation. And business model innovation is every bit as disruptive. Uh, for instance, if you look at Uber, Uber is a business model disruption. They use other people's, uh, uh, basically, the cloud and, and smartphones, so other people's infrastructures, and they put together markets in, that are very inefficient. Boom, disruption. And that's a business model innovation. Airbnb, that's a business model disruption, too. So business model can be every bit as disruptive. And how does that work in energy storage? Um, so there are companies in Silicon Valley that are offering storage as a service. So how does that work? Say you're a 7-Eleven. Somebody walks in, they want water, they open the fridge. At that point, there's a spike in demand. So in the U.S., for that one spike, you get to pay a higher energy charge for the rest of the month. That's called demand charges. And those demand charges can be about 50% of, of, the, of, the, of the actual bill of that 7-Eleven. By taking a battery and putting it within that 7-Eleven, you know, it's the size of a fridge, essentially you're going to hide those spikes, the utility's not going to see it. You get to save 10 to 50% of your bill. Same energy consumption, you get to save on your bill, right? But the business model is zero money down, zero, right? So the 7-Eleven or the Clarion Hotel or whatever takes no risk, whether financial or um, technical, in doing that. So even at today's prices, these kind of companies are being very successful by innovating in the business model realm. Um, there are a lot of numbers here, but um, just to give you an idea, if you keep this uh, storage as a service model going, uh, in the US, by about 2020, the, you don't need that much storage, you don't need one day, but one day of storage, of electricity storage, uh, for the average household in America, is going to cost $1.20. $1.20 a day for a full day, 30 kilowatt hours, of electricity storage by 2020. Now, you don't need a full day to disrupt utilities. And I'll give you an example. Arizona Public Services charges in the summer peak rates 49.5 cents, between 3 and 6 or 7. At midnight, they only charge 5 cents. So if all you have is four hours of storage, four hours, then essentially you disrupt the utility's pricing power because you're going to buy it at midnight, or at 1 a.m. or at 2 a.m., right? Um, four hours of storage in 2020 are going to cost $6 a month. Two lattes a month will disrupt the pricing power of utilities in the U.S., anyone who charges peaking rates. One latte in Norway, but two lattes in the U.S., right? And that's only 2020, that's, that's four years away, right? So business model innovation, as well as technology innovation, they can both be disruptive. The other way in which storage will be disruptive is on the grid. So large-scale storage means that essentially we won't need peaking power. So the reason we have peakers, gas peakers mostly, is that our grid is a just-in-time grid. The more demand goes up, the more basically we need to switch on the, the, the peakers and whatnot. In the US, peakers are about a third of generating assets, even though on average they're used less than 6% of the time, anywhere from you know, tens to hundreds of hours per year. 
If you have large-scale storage, essentially means you buy at night uh, and you sell when there is need for pickers, right? Um, and there's a utility in Texas called Encore that wants to build a $5 billion energy storage project today, and they say that the economics work at $350 per kilowatt hour. Guess what? We are already there. We're already at $350 per kilowatt hour, right? So essentially, even CEOs of conventional companies, uh, energy companies, are saying that after 2020, there may not be another peaker ever built, ever. What they're not saying is that even existing peakers are stranded. Because once you have these kind of storage uh, uh, over the grid, that's it, no need for peakers, stranded assets, right? So these are ways, different ways, in which um, energy storage can be disruptive to the grid, to today's grid. The next big disruption, electric vehicles. And one more reason to be disruptive, you can actually power your house with your car. In fact, this technology is ready. Uh, and you can power your car with your house, right? Vice versa. So um, I actually did the numbers for Norway. And when every car in Norway, all two million of them, cars plus uh, vans, uh, are fully electric, basically they'll be able to store almost 50% of the daily electricity demand in Norway in cars. Essentially, these things are power plants on wheels, right? 50%. Get that. Try that with your VW diesel, right? And by 2030, it's going to be over. And this is not in the future. This is happening right now as we speak. Thank you. <laughs>